Hello and welcome to Music Works, a podcast by Polyphony Arts. We're talking about the future of the classical music industry with some great guests. Thank you for joining us. This podcast was supposed to be one episode, but once Julia and I got talking, we hit so many important issues that by the time we did round up and sign off, I realised we had more than enough material for two. So that's what we've done, and here's the first part of this terrific conversation, after which you can either go straight to part two or take a break and come back to it when you're ready. Welcome to Music Works, a podcast by Polyphony Arts. I'm Katie Beardworth, and today I'm joined by Julia Cogan. Hi, Julia. Hi, Katie. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us. Julia is a soprano and screenwriter, and uh, she and I have been working together for some time now. Um, And she's come here to talk about the future of uh, the classical music industry. Right, Julia? We're here to talk about the unknown. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah. We're actually here, <laughs> far more sinister and possibly more interesting uh, thing, which is that we're going to talk about all the things that we haven't dared talk about in the past uh, because we were quite rightly nervous that if we talked about all these things, we would never work again. So you're about to find out, at least in our limited experience, about the CD underbelly of the classical music world and how the business of singing uh, is quite different from the the act of singing itself, which is noble, graceful, beautiful, enlightening and all the rest. But the business of it is an entirely different cup of tea. Absolutely. (laughs) I'm very excited to talk about this. I feel like you're going to say all the things (laughs) that many of us are not brave enough to say. (laughs) I really am. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fantastic. So where would you like to start? Oh, well, maybe you'd like to start by saying what what led you to the business in the first place and what, what your idea of the classical music world was when you began to work in it and, and, and how it actually was compared to that. that uh, Ooh. Let's say naive vision. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, absolutely. Well, it certainly mm. was. I've worked in classical music um, in almost every single job I've ever had. Um, I come from a classical music family. Both um, you know, my dad is a professional arts administrator. He used to run the Northern Symphonia, and um, so it's always been this kind of um, this thing that we do <laughs> is to do music and work in. Music oh, amazing! Well. I didn't know that you were a second generation. Oh yeah, ah. <laughs> absolutely. And so maybe it wasn't well. such a surprise to you. Ah, uh-huh. um, well, I think it was sort of accepted. I, I don't. I think that I went into music knowing that I was unlikely to make much money, <laughs> as many people do, and I now have many views about that, <laughs> both in terms of my own career and everybody else's as well, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, and I think I just, I was always just kind of brought up with like the love of music and we sort of just do it anyway, regardless of the impact on our lives, um, of that being our chosen career choice. Um, I have other relatives who are professional musicians who've actively discouraged their children from going into professional music because, of, because of the, um, the industry. So there are definitely many viewpoints on this just within my family. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that um, the the various you know problems with the industry, the the discrepancies, the unfairnesses, and so on and so forth, have been really evident um, from the word go. But obviously, you sort of work through it in your own way, don't you? So as a as a recently as a recent music graduate, getting my first job as an orchestra administrator, I was utterly prepared to be, you know the person in training, the person building their career and so on and so forth and the long hours and the outrageous demands on time and so on and so forth. Um, yes. That feels that feels like a sort of rite of passage. Um, and then yes. as I've gone on, obviously sort of working behind the scenes, I've seen what it's like for artists and 
um, you know, to try and have any kind of quality of life. And one of the reasons, I mean, I, I always wanted to be a professional singer and I think there are many reasons why I'm not one, but one of the main ones was that I could never quite get my head around the touring lifestyle and there's sort of like two ideas yes. about what makes a life. Like, so mm. one is that you sort of, you know, grow up and you know start a family and buy a house and put down roots and the other one being that if you want mm. to be um any kind of touring musician that's really difficult i think that was a really major factor in my discovering my love for the back <laughs> the back end of arts yes <laughs> if that's how yes. i can put it um <laughs> um because i got to be because i get to be involved in like brilliant projects and so on but you know largely on my own terms and i think that musicians don't get to operate on their own terms very often at all and that finding that um that point in which they're in their career they can say right uh, this is where i start to say this is my life and my career and i'm you know because this is what i've essentially done i've been through a sort of period yeah. of um you know i want a career in music so i will be at the beck and call mm. of the people who are in charge and then at some point I've said now I want to be in charge and that's the point at which I started my business and established all of the things that go with that um you well, know, so you brought up think, a, a yeah. few you've brought up a few very interesting points um the first is that even in the in the very lucky circumstance of success and of having work what what does that success actually mean and what does that success actually look like and it, it's important to say that it wasn't like this in the past so it's it's a fairly new phenomenon that soloists operatic soloists travel all over the world and generally speaking there are exceptions to this in the german houses and in the austrian houses where singers are fest which means that they actually have a steady job and sing an entire season with a particular opera house for those of us outside that system if you're lucky enough to have a job what that means is that with every contract you go to a new opera house and it all starts over again and the typical contract i suppose runs anywhere from three weeks to six weeks in my experience and yeah. that is a very peculiar lifestyle. And I know some very successful singers who've paid a very high price for that. They've never gotten married, or if they have, their relationships have folded apart. Many don't have children, and those with children hardly see them. Uh, and even, <laughs> even if you are lucky enough to be employed, there is that. The second thing that you brought up, which is also crucially important and as I've gotten older and as I've as I've started to create my own uh, content by writing um, something that I, I find harder and harder a pill to swallow is that you're completely at the creative mercy uh, of whoever's directing the show that you're in I'm delighted to be at the at the creative mercy of composers uh, because they are so kind and wonderful to singers and, and you're swimming in a sea of genius output and it's such a glorious feeling just to get to think about those things and which is why I wanted to spend my life doing it I just enjoy thinking about it so much but then then uh, you are faced with directors who may or may not uh, be good and and their will is law you ha you have no say I, I wonder if people realize when they watch singers on an opera stage just how little control those singers have the, there are exceptions for people of the stature of Pavarotti and company uh, but for us mere mortals um, who don't have that level of fame and power uh, it's the conductor and the stage director who rule um, and mm. so to give you an example I, I was working in a French opera house on a production of Ariadne of Naxos, Richard Strauss's opera, which I adore, singing my absolute favorite role of Zerbinetta. Um, and the conductor uh, had had me emphasize words in German that were that were simply wrong. He was making incorrect decisions, uh, and there was nothing I could do about it. Uh, he spoke no German, so it's uh, whereas I did, and so th there was no. 
things like that. Uh, when you're young, uh, you just swallow and, and move on. Uh, but as you get older, uh, it, it really, it, it becomes more than a little frustrating. But those, again, those are the problems that one should be so lucky as to have. Uh, and I, I want to go back to what you said uh, early on. Why did the part of your family uh, who tried to talk their children out of joining them in this field, what were the specifics uh, that they mentioned in, in trying to get uh, they will be constantly their, on the their road. Their offspring away. Yeah, they'll be constantly yeah. on the road, and they'll make no money, and they'll never see, never see their family. That was basically the upshot of it. Um, and I also, did meet I someone mean, recently. Oh yeah, go on. I, I was going to say, uh, th yeah. sorry to interrupt. I did meet somebody. They said, "Oh, you're an opera singer. Opera singers are rich." Mm. <laughs> I said, oh, uh, in, what, in what universe? Yes. Yeah. Little, yes. Yes, the reaction to what people say when you say you're an opera singer is, is probably a podcast episode in itself of just like a compilation Absolutely. of the... Uh, I once had a friend, a really, really close yes. friend of mine as an opera singer and her, what, she got really annoyed with one of my husband's friends once who was insisting that it just wasn't a job he was like yes you sing opera but what else do you do and was and I was I was like, outraged on her behalf as well because you know you just think, I've heard that many times yeah <laughs> heard that many times yes yeah. or you get my 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 favorite and everyone else's oh so have you ever been in the phantom of the opera which of course isn't an opera it's a musical although the and, even and better so version of that is have you ever thought of going on um x factor <laughs> I've had so, so many people say that to me. And, and also I have, I've had friends who have tried to explain to me that Susan Boyle is the greatest singer in the world because she won the X Factor. And it's, it's very hard yeah, to know where to yeah. start explaining. Yeah. <laughs> Which leads us on to the all important question of, is our business a meritocracy? And if not, why not? <laughs> Can you explain what you mean by meritocracy? I mean, do the best singers win? Are the best singers the ones with the best jobs? Are the best singers the ones who are the most well known? Uh, what determines within our own hierarchy in the profession? What, oh, goodness. what do you, how, how does it work? So I expected my greatest disappointment in, in the profession. Um, is that I always thought it was a meritocracy. And what I have found, unfortunately, is that that is not quite how it works. No, it's absolutely. It's a very political system. Very. Um, and it's political at the level of the agencies as well as the houses <laughs> themselves, because many times, uh, especially having sung in France a lot, the French houses tend to be run by business school graduates who have no background in music at all. Uh, and so oftentimes you will sing for someone who looks at you with a bovine expression and has no idea at all technically what differentiates you or musically from anyone else. And so the decisions are not based on any, any kind of musical know-how really. Uh, it's very, very different. Um, I, I know from from singing from conductors, um, I was almost always hired singing for conductors, whereas singing for directors, <laughs> uh, it, it just, uh, it was a fairly hopeless setup. Um, so there's, firstly, there is, there's on the level of the houses, but then Katie, maybe you could talk us through how the agencies work. There are very powerful agencies that are now meeting their end. And even though I feel terrible for the colleagues who, who have lost their agents and for the wonderful work they've done, they have also ruled our world with an iron and tyrannical fist. And do you, do you want to explain how this works? <laughs> Well, I would love to. I have to say, you've asked me the question that I dread being asked because I've never worked mm. for an agency until I ran one. <laughs> so I don't 100% know how they... Mm. What I do know is that... Um, and while we're, <laughs> while we're being frank, I can say that they, I do think that the business model of agencies doesn't work well for them or for artists or for art at all. 
because uh, and it's a big question that I get asked as an agent is is and I'm quite I think I've written about this before is that I I charge fees rather than a, a commission I've and I get quite quizzed about that all the time mm. um and I have to explain, first of all, um, that it's not, you know, a con and so on and so forth. And that actually, when you get a commission, you are still paying the person to do the stuff. It's just arranged differently. And often the, the commission percentages are much higher. And that's money that could be in the artist's pocket. But also, that does mean that, it, you know, in times of no performances, I am able to continue to work for people. And this is what we're seeing at the moment, unfortunately, is a huge um, problem with the agency world because they aren't able to make the money in the way that they did before. And so there's a lot of redundancies and a lot of, um, mm. a, you know, there are agencies closing and so on and so forth. And I think, you know, in many ways, this is indicative of part of the problem. It's not the whole of the problem, but it's definitely part of the problem with the, with classical music as a whole, which is what I feel the pandemic has brought up is that it's all based around live performance happening and people being paid on a gig by gig basis or a contract by contract basis for things that they're doing. And it doesn't provide anybody with any stability really as a whole. Obviously there, there are big companies, there are big artists, there are people who have stable lifestyles from music, but the percentage of those people as against the whole industry, I would say is quite low. Um, and in yes. general, we have a we, we have a system if, where it's 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 to, it's it is the gig economy. It is the definition of the gig economy for everyone involved. Yes. Yeah. But it's an unlike if we take if we take the whole thing a step back and look at two things. Um, I mean, there are very successful gig economies, as we know from rock music, and as we know from something far closer to opera, which is the West End. So anything to do with musical theater, that's quite a successful gig economy, though they're suffering a great deal now as well. Mm. But it's successful because a show in the West End runs until there is no more audience for it. It runs until it fails naturally. Whereas in the opera world, many years in advance, opera houses schedule their seasons and they only schedule a few performances which are very, very expensive to put on. So each new mm. production is hugely costly. And yet you know that the most you will ever make on it are the seats that you will have sold very, very quickly for performances that people want to see at the Royal Opera House, for example. And you know there are only six of those performances or eight, and that's it. Whereas in fact, mm. that show could run for a year. And that's where the real money kicks in. And also the singers are paid much less per performance in the West End and they sing many more performances. But because they have a steady job and get to stay in one place for quite some time, they're actually far better off as a result. And there is some sort of give and take between the actual market and, and mm -hmm. your expenditure, uh, which is crucial. And, and, and the other thing, uh, to, go, to go back to the all important issue of uh, the great artist agencies is that the most famous artists command huge fees and the most powerful agents have those artists on their rosters. They also have rosters full of underlings. And when an opera house wants one of the very few singers in the opera world who have name recognition, there are only a few handfuls of singers with real name recognition. They engage with the agency who has that has that singer on their roster. And when they do that, the agency has a vast amount of power to force that opera house to use the singers on their roster. And it's why it is so difficult for independent agents and also singers who are not on the rosters of those few agencies to get a job absolutely irrespective of their artistic merit. Um, and that's why Katie and I are only partly sad at the demise of some of the great agencies that are now going under, uh, because I think we both hope that, that it will open, open the door to a more meritocratic uh, system. Oh, absolutely. And I just think the thing that I think is sad is um, people losing their jobs and, and musicians losing their support at a time when they need it most. And that, that's what I just think is the most, yes. 
easily criticised thing about the model that the agencies are working on is that at the time when they're the most needed, they're the least able to provide that support because um, because of the because of the way the uh, the financial model works. Um, yes, absolutely. Yes, it's Sod's law. It's precisely it's Sod's <laughs> Indeed. law. Indeed. Um, yeah. And and it has it has flagged up all as you say all the inadequacies of our world. Um, it, I would be very curious to find out how how much money has been generated uh, by the selling the, the streaming of productions uh, of the past. I know that in the West End on Broadway, a great deal of money has been raised in that way. So for those of us who've wanted to see whatever shows in the West End that have been booked for, for many years in advance, um, mm. it, it's now possible to, to pay a little bit and see those online. Yeah, there's been a, a strange turn with classical music as well, in which a lot of it has been made available for free. Um, yes. Well, I think the, you, know, uh -huh. the, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is something that I talk about all the time. I think there are various mm. different types of content and there is certainly a place for free online content, sort of. Mm. But where an opera house, I think that, the, to my knowledge, the, the, the process they'll have gone through is we've already done this production filmed it spent all the money that's all happened people are missing opera so let's put it on the internet and then people can enjoy it and i think that is it's, that's really nice like that's you know people really enjoyed that when lockdown first started but what other art forms like for example the disney channel did and i've taken this from a blog post that i read this is not my yes. idea but this came this came from something that i read was that they they put I think they put like a, a slight discount on the uh, the 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 big offering of Disney films the, the big channel that they were going to release anyway and released it and made a ton of money <laughs> as far as I know and the thing is that um, the problem isn't so much with presenting free content as that it just makes a statement about the value of music. And I think that the classical music industry over and over again makes statements about its own value. And it's like, if you don't value yourself, no one else is going to value you. Um, and so wow, when that's... major opera houses say, here's some free content. And actually, after we've had this out for a month, we might start charging for it, by which point probably most people that wanted to see it have already seen it. Um, that says something completely yes. different from the other industries who are like, here's some great stuff and everyone's going to buy it. Off you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a good, there is a very good reason for that. Um, there's a very good reason why, uh, why we don't have so much content to sell. And it's because we live in a museum. And this is also something that is new. I wonder whether people realize that in the 18th century, the 19th century, until well into the 20th century, probably from the second half of the 20th century onwards, opera was, the operas that were mostly put on were brand new operas. Uh, so just like with a the film, there was a season where new works would cut up, come out and be presented and those works had value as a novelty, as, some, as, a, as a new work of art that then people had to, to go see. Uh, we don't have that at all because we are putting on the same uh, productions of Bohème uh, that everyone had seen and as lovely as it is to have a certain cast or another cast it's basically same old same old and the reason we have that is that so much contemporary uh, classical music um, is unpleasant to listen to uh, and it's horrible to admit as someone who has uh, recorded and sung a lot of contemporary music and I adore contemporary music and I, I champion it um, and, and just couldn't feel more strongly about the need uh, to create new music and to perform new music and to record it. Um, I have to admit that to my ear over 90% and I'm being generous here of new music, uh, I really don't understand uh, whom it's written for. Uh, essentially, I, I think people who go and I, I sometimes I, I've had um, I've had experiences where I, I've sort of sat in the audience listening to something that I I wasn't enjoying on any level, and I look, look around to see the expressions on on people's faces, and I, and I see that there's a kind of peer pressure 
uh, to <laughs> enjoy it in an intellectual uh, kind of, uh, you know, we are, we are smart enough to lie. Uh, it's not emotionally engaging content. Uh, and so, and this is entirely our, our fault uh, in the classical music world. So we, there's a great deal of complaining that we're very marginalized and not enough people listen to classical music, but um, there are many different kinds of music out there uh, that are hugely engaging and entertaining of all sorts. Uh, for people who are not particularly pretentious, uh, they're quite happy to listen to those kinds of music and get all the fun that they want out of that without turning. I mean, so we have to actually provide something that people want. <gasps> Shock and horror! <laughs> what? Well, what? We have to entertain people? What a crazy notion! Uh, but we do. We really have to. We have got in a muddle, haven't we? Again, about yeah, we've got in a muddle about art and culture and entertainment yes. and the relationship between those things. I think, um, obviously, I I know um, that you're an advocate for contemporary music, and I know that I am as well. So therefore, I feel that we can say these things. But you know, they are. Um, yes. You yeah you you do I mean it's a little bit like for me you know when you go to a modern art gallery and everyone's wandering around going hmm and you're sort of thinking is that a hmm, I love it or um, why am I looking at a sort of I don't know <laughs> well, I have I, I have to, I have to tell you this anecdote I have to tell you this anecdote because it so perfectly exemplifies what we're talking about I once a friend um, invited me to the Tate modern for a new exhibition and it was the press day so it's before it was open to the public and uh so we, we had a curator who was explaining the works of art to us and i walked into a large hall we all did and there was a shoe box an empty shoe box sitting on the floor and next to it was a security guard and i asked the curator why the security guard was there and she said it's so that nobody mistakens it for an empty shoebox and throws it away. <laughs> and it, it really is that sort of uh, the emperor's cloak, you know, the emperor's naked uh, situation. Um, yes, if we call it art, it is art. <laughs> if we call it art. But the yeah. audience is not stupid. This is the problem. Yeah. Uh, the audience is not stupid at all. Uh, audiences love to be moved and entertained and if we cannot do that someone else will um, but just to go down this route for a moment though because i had there is a train of thought that says that if you're still talking about it then it's had an impact and therefore it has an artistic value and i suppose the difference with between the shoebox and a contemporary opera is that the shoebox you could potentially look at for about 45 seconds and then say right okay I've now experienced that and I may always remember it because it's <laughs> so you say however a contemporary opera is somewhat more of a commitment <laughs> both in terms of um so that's the that's purely in the realm of the... disadvantage <laughs> yeah, well, quite <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know <laughs> I had a friend who, who said he went to the Bastille to watch a contemporary opera. When he entered, he sat down in a seat and uh, the curtain was already drawn and on the stage were 45 heads. So they had, they had dropped the level of the stage down and the singers just had their heads from the neck up. And for the next three hours, that is how that stage remained. And he said, I, I'm just not smart enough to understand this opera and never went to another contemporary opera again. Um, mm. so That's difficult this, as well, this though, is, isn't it? Mm, quite. Because, but you know, one contemporary, contemporary opera can ruin them all. <laughs> yeah. that, that's why it's so important. Uh, mm. It isn't, you know, in the, in the days of Mozart, uh, in the old days, it was very much uh, the law of the jungle. Your opera opened, if it was not a success on opening night, it, it closed. And when I say success, it wasn't critical success. It was people in the rafters who brought food and rotten vegetables to fling at you if they weren't happy. Um, and it was that direct, that immediate, the response. Um, and there, were, there was no question about the need to have entertainment value in the content. <laughs> it was very, very clear. 
Uh, but this brings us to another another question. So if it's not the audience uh, and their enjoyment who determine what new works of art, because I don't want anyone to imagine for a moment that we don't have genius composers out there or genius directors uh, or genius singers Absolutely. or genius actors. We have more talent out there now than I believe we've ever had in the history of humankind. There's so many people from uh, various backgrounds getting that education who could never have, have dreamt of that before, whether it's stepping out of their own classical music traditions into the Western classical music traditions. So we have outstanding singers from all over the world and we have more classical composers uh, than we've ever had and, and many of them are great, great talent. So I would say that the difficulty comes in separating out uh, the entertaining pieces of lasting value uh, and and what is what is somehow commissioned by the establishment, which is a very very strange thing. So the the way the way these things work, in order to have a piece performed, a new piece performed at something like the Royal Opera House or or wherever it is, generally it is um, it has to be commissioned by the house. It's a very expensive thing to do uh, because commissions at that level cost a fortune. Um, whoever whoever are, are the reigning composers get, get those commissions. Um, and it, it's all quite a mysterious process. By which, so, so there are very, very few new works because they are so expensive to put on. Uh, and those works are not judged before they're put on a stage. So uh, what, if the work has been commissioned, it will, regardless of what actually is written then beyond the commission process, it will find its way to the stage, whether it's good or not. And it will play for the exact number of performances that it's been scheduled to play. Um, mm. And so it's, it's what I have found uh, as someone who's commissioned, I've, I've had a great deal of works written for me from composers who I think are, are the sort of genius uh, composers of, of our time, most of whom, surprise, surprise, are unknown. So the first time I was offered the opportunity to commission new works was uh, working with uh, an orchestra that used to be called uh, Chamber Orchestra Kremlin, a Russian chamber orchestra that has nothing to do with the Kremlin, um, and I think are now called the Moscow Chamber Orchestra, something like that. Uh, but an absolutely outstanding string orchestra, and I was able to commission eight different composers uh, to write Gosh. pieces for me. And so when I began choosing my composers, I decided that I would open the field to the entire world. And I began by looking up the winners of all the most prestigious composing competitions. So there are many competitions around the world for composers. And what I <laughs> that is that what I found was that that is not where you go looking uh, for the great composers, which is a huge, <laughs> a huge irony in and of itself. Uh, I actually one of my all time favorite composers and the composer who's written the most for me uh, was a chap called Eskander Bekmambetov, quite a mouthful. But he did indeed win the audience prize at a competition judged by Noxus, the recording label, uh, and he was absolutely outstanding uh, and wrote a lot for me. Uh, mm. But it, it's very surprising what is now considered um, as the sound of today and, and why, why people feel the need to make such a judgment. Um, a, an excellent example of this was my last recording uh, of the songs, uh, the art songs of Isabelle Aboulker. So Isabelle Aboulker, who is, to my mind, the greatest living song composer. And she writes in a kind of post poulenc style. So very French, but a style entirely unique to her. Uh, and it's extremely warm. It's remarkably varied. And, and we were delighted this year when our CD was chosen, the classical CD pick of 2019 by the Arts Desk. Um, so that's, that was really wonderful. I was so glad that someone could hear the, the tremendous lasting value of her artistic input Absolutely. into the field. Incredibly well but deserved. It's, it's, it's a fantastic it's a, disc. 
Thank you very much. But Isabel struggled for for decades to get a single one of her pieces heard. And the reason for that was that Isabel, who's now in her 80s, uh, she ran headlong into the contemporary music movement in France, which was led by Pierre Boulez, a very great composer, but who imposed his own aesthetic and his own school of thinking on the whole of France. And for decades, she wrote letters trying to get her pieces uh, performed. And she was turned out everywhere she went for the crime of writing tonal music. It was deemed that tonal music was too old fashioned for France. And her genius compositions were ignored because they were too entertaining and too accessible. Uh, adjectives that very rarely describe contemporary music today, <laughs> unfortunately. Or things that are undesirable. <laughs> anyway. Oh, the shame. If you want contemporary music that is accessible and entertaining, the place you have to go now is film scores. I always laugh when people tell me that they don't like classical music because Everyone loves classical music, and I can prove that everybody loves classical music because everyone yeah. loves film scores, and film score music is contemporary orchestral music, much of it uh, of a post-German uh, romanticism kind introduced into Hollywood uh, by the refugees coming from Europe in the 30s and 40s. Mm. So there you go. Mm. Absolutely. So do you think that, say I have a view that um, audiences get either forgotten or misunderstood constantly in uh, in our kind of Completely. quest as classical music, musicians or um, music organisers to yes. find success? <laughs> um, you know, I, yeah. I completely agree with what you're saying about, about entertainment. But I also well, we think don't ask, do we? Well, we don't we don't ask. We simultaneously make assumptions and also cling to our art at the same time. So it's like we produce all, a lot of very kind of esoteric, yes. complex, not necessarily enjoyable to listen to music. And then we bemoan the fact that nobody wants to listen to it. Um, simultaneously, we don't challenge audiences mm. enough, I don't think, because we don't <laughs> we don't put on things that are contemporary, entertaining, good to listen yeah. to or trust them enough to understand that it'll be good. Because also, you know, there's sort of like this idea that if you have a contemporary piece for a programme, you have to kind of sneak it in, in between the Brahms and the Beethoven, and then they might just enjoy it if they don't Absolutely. know it's coming. <laughs> um, I'm to obviously talking more concert programming here. Absolutely. And, um, you, know, and yeah. uh, you know, I don't think but that both, does. both. Yeah, yeah. So simultaneously, we sort of don't um, allow people to be uh, intelligent and creative and understand what's great about new music. And simultaneously, we we keep it niche. And I think that the nicheness of the classical music industry is its most enormous failing. And it never used to be like Absolutely. that. I mean, we talked about the, the no. operas of Mozart and so on. It was always for the, for the masses and for mass always. enjoyment as anything entertainment mm. related should be. Um, and somehow we've ended up in a place mostly where everything is, you know, beset by um, ritual and a sort of cliqueiness, which is just unforgivable, in my opinion. Yes. Um, yes. And really damaging. I mean, there are uh, having I will qualify that by saying there are tons of organisations who are trying to do exactly not that and make sure that they're doing things that are good. But in in the main, I still think there are probably at least as many people who don't listen. for every person who loves classical music now i reckon there's at least one if not many more who would but don't know they would because of the way it's presented to them i think that's undoubtedly true and i've uh when my sons were were small i would go into their schools and sing and the children are always absolutely bowled over uh mm. i had i was uh i i, I sang uh years ago for for the Opera d'Avignon, so the Avignon Opera House. And they had a wonderful system of busing in children, especially from underprivileged uh, areas. And in France, they, they do this quite regularly. They have a matinee for school children. And it was absolutely marvelous to see the reaction on the kids. It was a magic flute production. Uh, 
that we did with the with the Amsterdam puppet theater. So it was fantastic. Oh, there were yeah. singers on stage and there were the puppets. So we were all reenacting the opera live as it was being enacted on the stage within a stage. So quite entertaining for children. Um, mm. And I asked one little girl, what was your favorite part after the show? And she said, it was when you were screaming. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, just perfect. Uh, it, it, sometimes so you're the queen of the night, and I really was very angry and, and, very <laughs> and But they children are entirely capable uh, of judging, and uh, it, it's 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 just such a shame. But you, you see it everywhere. This the bias against classical music as something stuffy, as something old, as mm -hmm. something unexciting, and it's constantly held up as the antithesis of pop music, which is full of energy and vivacity and uh, and, and something to get people excited about. And people all, will often tell me, "Oh, uh, you know, if I want to relax, I put on classical music," and I. I, it, th yeah. That just makes me wild because I, I can't think of anything less relaxing. Like it's so I, I specifically stay away from classical music if I need to calm down because it is it's just too moving. It's too emotionally engaging, uh, mm. and it, it is that because of its enormous richness and complexity, um, and variety and depth and all all the things that it, it is kind of uh, the most fulfilling and gratifying music that there is because it digs deeper than any other kind of of music so it is i don't buy for a minute that people wouldn't enjoy it if they were introduced to it and i've also had many people tell me oh i've always wanted to learn about classical music because i didn't grow up in a home that played it but they have no idea where to begin um and there was something yeah, it's I, so huge uh, isn't it i, I mean was, yeah where do you it's begin? It's so intimidating. You know, it's so yeah. big. Where do you begin? Um, and it's quite, it's quite intimidating. And it is intimidating because of all these stuffy rituals, as you say, and the way it's presented. You know the voice of the presenter today. It's, it's all, all of this that that scares people and puts them in their place. And if I, and you can, and the proof is is in the incredible popularity of people like Catherine Jenkins and Andrea Bocelli and all the quote-unquote crossover artists. It's, it is what people who don't really understand what opera singing is or, or, or what it does. It's who they listen to when they when they want to hear what they think is is opera. Uh, and everyone loves, there's your X Factor, Nessun Dorma. Who hasn't yeah. heard Nessun Dorma? Everyone's heard it, everyone loves it. That's one aria of very many. And I always tell people, just for God's sake, please listen to the Pomerati version before you tell you <laughs> tell me anything, anything else. Um, and compare the two. Listen to them side by side, all right? And then you'll you immediately you'll see what opera is and what it isn't. Well, I just think the um, you know people in general are more than capable and and want to enjoy complex, deep things. And there's yes. this sort of and and not always, you know, that not you know we all love something that's not too complicated and so on and so forth. But I think there's a sort of a bewilderment by the amount that goes into classical music because everyone seems to think it's something that you need an education to enjoy, yeah. which is not at all true. Not um, at all. Not at all. And and everyone, you know, and there is a lot to it. You know, producing an opera is a completely different kettle of fish from producing even an album of pop music, never mind a song. However, they're the two diff completely different things, not necessarily for comparison. But the process of producing, for example, an opera is fascinating, you know, and it is, mm. if it's seen as like interesting and deep, that's a lot different from being yes. like, oh, couldn't even possibly, you know, begin to to get into that, you know? And again, I think the industry I think one of the... puts this forward. I don't, mm -hmm. I think it is murky and and hidden and confusing, whether it's yes. on purpose or through major, yes. um, like lack of foresight. <laughs> I just think these things are great. And, Whichever it and is, it's a catastrophe. Yeah. Agreed, yeah, definitely. It's, it, yes, that is, a, mm. yeah. Um, I think one of the great misconceptions uh, that people have about opera, and this is, again, it's our own fault, is that it's artificial. It's the artifice of it that puts people off. 
Um, and people don't realize that paradoxically and remarkably, opera singing improves uh, with, it correlates to how, the quality of it correlates to how natural it is or how naturally produced it is. So now we're going to get into just a, a tiny little bit into classical technique, uh, which unfortunately is something that's getting a little, a little bit lost. Um, but it's, it's really very, very important because it has, not because of any uh, abstract reason of, of what's right and what's wrong or which school prevails, but because for my ear, uh, for me, it's just not entertaining or interesting to listen to people who sound artificial. And what I mean by that is specifically the kind of stereotypical opera sound. So when you say to a child, what does an opera singer sound like? And they go, bah, bah, bah. Uh, and, and then you go to the opera house and you hear exactly that. But that isn't what good opera singers sound like. Good opera singers sound completely natural. Uh, and that is what bel canto is. Uh, there is a school of singing that was developed in Italy in the 17th century that for, for me is still the one and only great school. And the only reason it's the one and only great school is that it's the one that maintains complete naturalness. So there are technical tricks to making that sound focused. There are technical tricks to essentially turning the inside of your head into the opening of a trumpet acoustically speaking but you do that by keeping the sound exactly as you're speaking so your speaking voice and your singing voice are one and the same and there's no blah or anything like that um, and I so I think for, for me and if you look at any of the great singers of bel canto Joan Sutherland, Bira Lefreni, Pavarotti and many many others that is what they all have in common and that is why they're so touching and that's why we can't get enough of looking at them and listening to them because the sound is so direct heart to heart um, and th that's also a very important point if we want some uh, some audience members to to turn up who are, who are not from the little clique um, absolutely and it's not it's not lost on audiences i don't think they might not be able to explain it like you just have but they they do hear it yeah and see it and feel the, the change, the, the difference in connection. We're going to take a break there. Thank you for listening and please come back for more of this terrific conversation with soprano Julia Cogan, where we look at the questions we've raised and try and identify some answers in episode 15, Let's Talk Remedies. Thank you so much for listening today. To find out what we're up to, do join our mailing list or follow us on social media. And if you'd like to support the podcast by buying me a coffee, you can do that on buymeacoffee.com. Thank you so much. See you next time.